Hi, let's talk about HTML. I want to put an image on my web page. So I do img src equals something, well, astronaut.png for instance. Save it, go to the browser, and I have an astronaut. Amazing. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but the thing is, what if I instead I mean, this is a bitmap. What if I want to show the, the 3D model that this is rendered from? What would I do then? Maybe I would do model viewer, and then it's a GLB file instead, maybe. We need to close that tag. And it doesn't work. Of course it doesn't work, because the browser doesn't know anything about the model viewer. We need to tell it what a model viewer is. So we're going to load a script. Script type is a module, because this is modern JavaScript. And it is a model viewer.js. And now we have an astronaut again. And this time, well, it doesn't look very fancy. Except that we look here that, yes, this is a model viewer. And for instance, if I, if I now go here and add another attribute, camera controls, then the astronauts comes alive. And now I can actually look at it from all different angles. This, what we have here, is a web component. And that's what we're going to talk about a little bit today. My name is Leif. I work at a company named Vardin. You might have seen our booth over there also. Uh, what I do is I'm architecting my way around product development. In practice, that means that the stuff I show you today were things that I imagined and started visioning about five years ago, three years ago, one year ago maybe. The stuff I work on today is something that Maybe next year I will be here actually telling you about it, maybe in five years' time. We don't really know, because it's software development. What we're going to talk about... Okay, we actually started a bit already with the web components. Uh, we're going to talk a bit more about them. Then we're going to talk about what Vardin is. And then we're going to combine those two, so Vardin and web components. How does that work out? Uh, so, talking about those web components, I showed you one example. It's probably not that practical unless you really like want to work with 3D models. Uh, I can show you a much more practical example, actually, on GitHub. Actually, let's refresh this because I think this was loaded yesterday. Uh, if I go here, this is kind of to prove that web components actually do exist, or like are used in real life. So for instance, all these like two years ago, six days ago, and so on, those are actually also web components. So for instance, here time ago, if I just change, now it says last year here for this row, if I change this one, just pop in this year instead, then it says yesterday. And it's again, kind of magic. It looks like HTML, the browser sees it as HTML. How does this work? It's really two really simple things that you just combine and then you get web components. The first one is called custom elements. It's a browser spec, what's implemented in all major browsers except Edge last year. And now soon when Edge will get Chromium, uh, be based on Chromium, it will also have, have custom components. So to see what we have here, uh, I'm gonna create in my body, I'm going to add uh, my element, like so. If we expand it, as we see that, yes, we have a my element. If I go to the JS console, I do dot .constructor for the select element. It says that, okay, this is an HTML element, which means that it's just, just a regular element, nothing special with it. It's kind of as a div. Uh, but then we can define, instead of HTML element, we define our own class, my element, 
extends HTML element, and then, well, that's interesting. I need to refresh because I forgot to do that after the practice round. So my element there again, and now we do my element, and now it didn't explode. So what we have here is a JavaScript class. We define a constructor just to log that the constructor was run, connected callback just to log that that was run, disconnected callback the same, attribute change callback, and then we define a static property called observed attributes, saying that the cool attribute should be observed. Now to actually make this used, we need to do custom elements dot define my, oh actually I had it typed there already, my element. Then I say like to the browser that whenever you see an HTML element with the tag my dash element, then you should use this class that I just defined. So when I run that, we see that immediately we get logged that the constructor was run, we get run the, uh, logged that the connector callback was run, and if I now look at $0.constructor, I need to select the right element. Now I see that yes, now the constructor, so basically the class of this JavaScript element instance is now my element instead of whatever it was previously. Can also show here now if I, as you saw, we listen to the cool attribute. So if I say now cool and the coolness level is extreme without typos, uh, then we now see that yes, we again got a callback call with this. And finally, the last feature, it's really all there is to custom elements, is that then now also if I completely remove my whole document, then we also got a disconnected callback call there. All these four really simple things taken together gives you lots of, of control. You can do lots of custom stuff in the browser just by getting events when an element is created, no matter how it's created by the browser, get events when it's attached and detached, and get events when, the, when attributes change. That's all you need to construct almost anything. Then the next thing, uh, Shadow DOM. That's the second kind of pillar of web components. The point with Shadow DOMs is that you can encapsulate the contents of your web component. So you can hide things so that CSS from outside doesn't by accident cause problems inside your component. And also you can have your own internal CSS that won't in any way leak out to the outside. And also the same kind of with children in the DOM and so on. So to use this, um, I would cheat a little bit. Um, now I need to select the body and say that body's inner HTML looks like this. So what we have here is we have a span and then we have another span that is inside a div. So really basic stuff. And now I'm going to play with this div. What I'm going to do first is I'm going to do attach shadow and we need to define mode open because the spec writers couldn't agree on what would be the default. So we always need to define it. When I do that, I have a syntax error. Now, when I did it, span two disappeared. If you go to the elements, we see that, yes, this div is here, the span is here, but we also have this shadow root. And when an element has a shadow root attached, then that is kind of going ahead of the, the regular children of that element. What we can do then, uh, let's give this shadow root some content also. So $0 shadow root inner HTML. We just put a span there, and now we see that yes, now that span is shown, uh, and because it's now here inside the shadow root. To use all these, I mean, so far we haven't done anything useful, but to see the really useful stuff, uh, I'm going to define some styles uh, in the head. So these are global styles. Mm, style. Let's close it also. So what I'm going to do is that spans should have color blue. 
and then also for the body I'm gonna say color red. Now when I apply this we see that this span, the one that is directly in the body, for that one this CSS selector matched so it's blue. But then for the other one, the one that is inside the shadow root, the CSS selector did not match so all span should be blue. But what did happen is that it inherited the color property from the body. So properties are inherited through shadow roots, but selectors are not matched. Then what we can also do is to add our own styles inside the shadow root. So if I change the HTML here, a style, and let's do a really simple thing. Let's just say again, spans are font weight bold. Do I need to close this? No. Uh, so now, again, we get the opposite. This span inside the shadow root is bolded, but the CSS doesn't match the outside, so the, the span in the body is not bolded. The last thing I'm going to show you about shadow root is that you can also add a new uh, HTML element, namely slot. And what that means is that this span that is kind of the non-shadow content of this div, that now gets shown in the place of this slot element inside the shadow root. But as you see also, it's blue and it doesn't, it isn't bold. So again, its select, CSS selectors are matched based on the global styles and not the internal ones. And that's basically all there is to shadow. No, there are a couple of more shadow root features, but that's the basics. And taking these two together, shadow root for encapsulation and custom element for life cycle things, you can do almost anything. The trick is though, you don't want to do things in this way because what I show now is really low level stuff. Instead, you want to use, for instance, there are a bunch of different libraries, but my favorite is a lit element. It's done by the Google guys who actually also have been really the driving force behind these custom element and shadow root uh, specs. Uh, what we see here is uh, JavaScript, but it's modern JavaScript, as I like to call it. We have something that looks like annotations. They are called dec decorators. They are not yet standardized, but uh, on a good track for that. Uh, so we actually have our simple greeting, in this case, uh, extending lit element, and then we just decorate it saying that this, should, this class should be exported as a custom element with, with this tag name. We define a regular JavaScript property on it, and then also a decorator for that property saying that this should be treated by lit element as a kind of magic property. So lit element will take care of automatically doing so that when you change the attribute value, through HTML, then the proper JavaScript property value will also change and vice versa. And then finally with lit element you define a render function which lit element takes care of calling whenever necessary and they then give out the whatever stuff should actually be used. And here you can also then run any any script inside like instead of this dot name you can do have any JS expression there but mostly you just want to have these just get this property value. So that's how you do web components. Then the question is, how do you use them? That's really easy. You just use them as any uh, HTML element. If you can use a div, then you can use a custom element. But it gets a little bit deeper because really what you have in your application is like you have nested things inside each other. So here we have like some dialogue for editing something. That's the kind of whole editor. And then it's made up from like uh, the form part it's made up from lots of small fields. One of those fields there is, is highlighted. And then that inside, 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 hold that box, we get to the actual native input element that the user can type, type text into. And the thing with web components is that it's up to you how you use them. Maybe you just want to use your own whatever fr JavaScript framework or some other framework for doing the kind of high level things, defining your forms, defining your, your views and so on. But then these individual small like text field components and so on, those you can use as custom elements or web components. But you can also actually do so that basically each of these red boxes 
Each of them are your own defined custom element, and through that you get a quite good structure to your, to your application also. There is this page called customelementseverywhere.com, which helps you know how you can use, because with some, some uh, JS frameworks, there are some gotchas with using web components. You need to do some things in a slightly weird way because it interferes with how the kind of framework's own components work. But on that page, you can find all the information on how to do things uh, otherwise also. That was all I wanted to tell about web, web components on their own. So now let's continue with talking about Vaadin. That's the company I work for, so a little bit of bragging or shameless plugs here. Sorry about that. Vaadin, what you really do is that we focus on productivity. Many others focus on performance. But uh, we kind of, I mean, Google needs performance. They have billions of users anytime. You probably don't have billions of users in your application. So probably more important that you are productive than that you have absolute the best possible performance. One of the reasons for that also is that we believe that in order to get great user experience, UX, you won't do that if you are struggling with, with the basics. So by giving you, the developer, great DX, developer experience, then you will be able to do what the users really want. The last really fundamental thing for Vaadin is that we are a web thing, but we're also a Java thing. So we, we kind of mix those two together, and that's, uh, at least from my point of view, that's the really exciting thing from, from, from my work, like how you can make those two kind of similar, but still very different words actually work together. When you use Vaadin, you always use uh, our web components. We have our own library of, of about 50 different components for most of the basic needs you have, like buttons and checkboxes and dialogues and data grids and all those kinds of things that you need when you build almost any kind of application, especially if it's a business application, so lots of forms, lots of data and, and that kind of stuff. I'm going to show a little bit about those components. I'm going to use, as an example, our uh, date picker. Um, so here we have a really beautiful date picker. Uh, it's a really mobile optimized, so you can just either with your mouse scroll or just with your finger on a touch screen, scroll through the dates here to, to pick some value. Uh, and then the really cool thing with all these uh, body elements is that they have a unified theme which uses another quite new browser feature, which is uh, CSS variables or CSS custom properties, depending on how you, how you look at things. So what you can do with those is uh, make it so that all these different Vaadin components react to the same top-level properties. If the browser just would let me type something there. There we go. So I can, for instance, define a Lumo border radius. Let's set it to 10 px. And now you see that all these different parts of the UI get quite heavily rounded corners. If I really bump it up to 20, it gets kind of obvious already. But then I can actually put it to zero and then, then all the corners, like for instance, on these, these input fields, they are, are, are really sharp angles. Similarly, we also can, I mean, there's a bunch of, of different ones, but another quite impactful one is uh, Lumo primary color, let's set it red. And then for instance, this order button gets red and this highlight gets red and so on. And now this blew up. Luckily I was done with it. And if you're not happy with Vaadin's own components, you can go to the Vaadin directory with lots of third-party components also. Here you can find like recent example, a combo box that also lets you do multiple selections. So you can get a drop down and pick like that value and that value and that value. All these things that I show you are completely open source, completely free to use, uh, Apache 2 license, so no strings attached basically. Uh, we have a open source community, like all in all 150,000 developers-ish 
happily using different versions of Vardin, two, three hundred uh, contributors on GitHub, and basically all that, what you would expect from a modern open source project. But someone also needs to pay our salaries, so we do have pro subscriptions, prime subscriptions, and enterprise subscriptions. That's about some advanced components like charting libraries, support services like uh, direct chatting with a Vardin expert and guaranteed to get results, and enterprises then more about really enterprise features like 10 years of support for, for any Vardin, uh, version of Vardin and so on. And then also we have an army of consultants who are really happy to help you get, get things done. But that's not all I wanted to talk about. Next up, a really brief history of Vardin, uh, and especially like how we have ended up using web components, because that's quite an interesting story. Everything began like 20 years ago. That was by the year, that, the year when Tomcat was first released, the year when IE5 was a new cool thing. It was the first browser with this XML HTTP thing, which turned out to be Ajax, which turned out to be just whatever you do. The same year, Vardin founders hadn't founded Vardin yet, but they built a healthcare portal, and they built it in Perl. And they said, there has to be a better way. So the next year, they founded Vardin. That's also, for instance, the year when JSON was in or defined, the year that the first version of Spring was released. So we're still really in ancient times. A couple of years later, first Vardin version using some really weird ideas, XSLT, so take XML, have another other XML document that defines how to transform that XML, and that gives you a web application, right? Yeah, those were the days. Fast ahead a couple of years again, the year after Java 6, the year after jQuery was first released, so we're getting modern but not really there. Then Vardin also switched to like, hey, maybe we should use these modern like JavaScript things instead. Except that no, it wasn't really fun to write JavaScript back in those days because browsers were a real mess. So instead we adopted a GWT, formerly known as Google Web Toolkit. Uh, it lets us or anyone write Java that is compiled into JavaScript. And it also has lots of abstractions that make the browsers behave. And that was a really successful model. At the same time, the web platform evolved. Seven years ago, the, there was the first draft for the specifications that end up as the custom elements and shadow DOM that I just showed you. And then just three years ago, the final spe specifications were done and the browser started implementing those for real. Last year, we got out Vardin 10, which then threw out all of that GUID stuff and instead focusing only on using web components for all the kind of rendering thing. So that's really using just what's built into the browsers, which is really a future-proof thing. And then this year, finally, we got uh, also uh, support for NPM because that's where all the cool guys publish their web components. So now, uh, latest and greatest we have also makes that really easy. That was in short, what Vardin the company is about. And now let's instead have a look at what about Vardin and web components, because, well, as, as you saw, there is quite much tie in there, but we're still getting to the, in my opinion, coolest part, which is you can do all that just from Java running on your server. So what you really have with Vardin is that you can write code like this, like you new vertical layout component and that contains then a text field component and a button component. This is what JavaFX code could look like, just different names of the components or swing back in the days and so on. And what you see on the screen then is obviously a text field and a button. But behind the scenes in the browser, these are actually the Vardin web components. So it's a Vardin vertical layout, a Vardin text field, a Vardin button, and so on. This is a good start. But to actually build an application, you of course also need to make it come alive. So you can add click listeners or whatever click listeners. These are run as Java on the server, which means that you have direct access to all your backend stuff. If, uh, and, and you can have like 
your business logic there. It doesn't have to be exposed as JavaScript that someone else can run and so on. Next thing that you need is to have different views so that everything isn't just one thing, but instead split things up into uh, different URLs showing different things. So you define your co any component class, just pop an annotation on it, and uh, it will be made available in the browser. In this case, rendered inside a main layout class, which probably contains your like main navigation and so on. These views can have URL parameters. So in this case, the slash one, two, three, any integer goes, and then the framework will take care of running the set parameter method so that you get the value that the user or that the user navigated to. Probably they didn't type in that URL. Next thing you of course need is to have, get some data into those views. Uh, for instance, into a data grid, really simple, just create a grid component instance, give it a simplest case, just a list of items, define some columns just with uh, callbacks like method references in this case, and there you have a grid lazy loading things to the browser. So even if you have like thousands of items on the server, the browser only needs to download the first 10, 20, depending on how big the screen is. And then as the user scrolls, it downloads more and more. If you have really much data, you can also quite easily lazy load also from the database. So instead of loading them all into, into memory, you just load the ones that you actually want and then callbacks to, to get more as needed. This really easily integrates with uh, Spring or CDI, so you can inject your Spring data rep repositories or whatever services you use, and, and through that really easily get your data in there. One final thing that is quite unique with, with Vardin is the security aspects. Because of the way the framework controls the communication between the browser and the server, and kind of has has control over, over all of those things, it can also help you with avoiding lots of security mistakes. So for instance, in Vardin, if you just set a name field to be uh, read-only, of course it will be rendered as read-only, re read but also if the browser sends a message saying that, hey, now we change the value of this text field, then the Framework will see that, nope, this field is read-only. I refuse to accept that. So you don't need to add your own explicit logic for testing those kinds of things. It just kind of follows automatically from the state of the component. Same also goes with uh, any kind of validation of data. You just define it as a server-side callback, and that just gets handled automatically for you. There is a small round-trip delay, but in most cases that isn't a problem. And this also then takes care of like showing the error message in the right place. And this even works if you, instead of callbacks, you just use uh, bean validation. So you just put an annotation on your class and then Vadim will take care of showing the error message at the right place in the, in the UI also, not just a big blob uh, at the submit button, but actually in the right place. How does all this work? Let's have a look at a really simple Hello World application. Text field, a button, adding those to some kind of layout. I don't show that one. And then just a simple click listener that shows a notification. So what happens here is that when you load that page, it's a servlet that Vardin registers for you. It sends up, out uh, just a really basic HTML document. It doesn't contain almost anything. It sends out the JavaScript that is kind of the client-side engine of Vardin. Uh, browser is instructed to download all the web components that you're going to use, and then it contains a JSON payload that actually renders things. It instructs like what, what components to, to show where. So what we'll actually end up with is something like this. Then you type something into the text field, click the button, then Vardin communication layer catches that event and sends something along these lines, like saying that now the value in the text field is uh, Marcus, and the thing that has happened is that the button was clicked. This goes out as a regular Ajax request. The Vardin servlet takes, handles that one, finds the right session, finds the right instance that was created when you navigated there, finds the button, 
and calls all its click listeners. In this case, this callback is called, shows a notification, and what that leads to is the response going out, containing again a simple JSON payload saying that what has changed since last time is that now you should show a notification with this kind of content, and that's the way it goes. Enough about theory. I will round this up by actually building an application using this. You can go to GitHub and have a look at it your, or have a look at the code yourself also. But I'm going to code it for you. Why do we have breakpoints there? Well, uh, so right now, let's zoom in a little bit like this. Right now we have just a starting point, yet another uh, hello world. But what we want to do is uh, model browser. So we had those 3D models with the model viewer and we want to use that web component, integrate that with Vardin to actually browse through all the models I have here on, the, on, on, my, on my machine. So to get doing, going with that, we start by creating a new element. Oh, that's small. Uh, element and let's call it, no, let's call it uh, the tag name that we should use for this element is model viewer. Uh, and then we need to uh, configure it, so we need to set an attribute, the name is src, and then we need to give it the actual contents of, of the file. Uh, so what we do is a new stream resource. Uh, actually, let's, uh, let's create a file. That actually is the file we want to show here first in the first step. So it's in users, my home directory models, and astronaut GLB. That's almost GLB. So now we can use this file to actually get the content. Uh, this is a lambda that just needs a stream file input stream from that file, no, from the astronaut. And then because this is Java, no, because this is Java, we need to catch some exceptions. Why doesn't this compile? It wants a name, thank you. Get name. And now it complains about the thing I expected. So actually need to catch this. This is a bit ugly, but that's Java for you. Uh, throw new unchecked IO exception. That's always the solution. And then fine, stop redeploying. Uh, then finally, we need to get the element that is uh, backing this uh, vertical layout that is the whole application here. So we get the element DOM element that that represents, and we append as a child this uh, model viewer. And now we're almost done. The last thing we need to do is to also actually get the model viewer from NPM. So we add an annotation, NPM package, and the value is the name it has in NPM, which is Google slash model viewer. And then we need to define a version and 071 is one of the latest. And now I had extra one of these. And then actually also, let's also instruct Vardin that it should actually load the JavaScript from this uh, NPM package. So at model, uh, Google slash model viewer, like this. Now we're actually good to go. And now this redeploys it for instance, runs Webpack to actually produce things here, here, and now everything is up and running, and we should hopefully have a model viewer, yes. But what we got here, it's not good. We have lots of magic strings like, why should I need to know that this is the tag name and that the attribute name is SRC and so on. So what you really want to do is to extract this into a reusable component class instead. So a model viewer class extends just a regular Vardin component. 
just to be semantically correct, these annotations belong here now, doesn't really matter in practice. We define a tag annotation, which is what is the value of the element that this should be backed by. And then we can do a set S or C that gets a file. And that's basically the same thing that we had here already. Except that this is the name of the variable and this is again the element that is backing this component. And finally, now we can instead a new model viewer component. We can set the SRC of it to this astronaut and now instead use a much smoother API, just add a component as a child of another component. So model viewer. This would show exactly like the same on the screen, but the code is much more better structured now. What we can also do is, for instance, uh, enable the attribute that I showed you previously, the one about camera controls to actually be able to move things around. We can, for instance, do that in the Java constructor. So get element set attribute camera controls, and it's a Boolean attribute, so we just set it to true. One thing we see here also is that, okay, now the astronaut is quite small, so let's make him bigger. Uh, to make him fill, all, fill the whole screen, uh, we first need to make this uh, layout fill the whole screen, so this dot set size full, and then the same also for the model viewer component, if I can type it, set size full, except that this doesn't define a set size full method, but what we can do is just implement has size. It's a really handy mixing interface, so it actually defines, if I, if I go there, it defines default method set size full, which just sets the width to to 100% and the height to 100%, and that one just gets the element and sets the styles of it, basically. So now, if I go to the browser, now we have a big astronaut instead. Next thing we want to do is to actually be able to browse all the different 3D models instead of just using showing this one all the time. For that, we can do a data grid and actually have at least all the files from the file system. So a new grid, not git properties, no grid. Uh, it's a grid of files in this case. You might actually want to encapsulate that, but this is a demo, so it's fine. Uh, and grid set items. Uh, we want to get all the items from this place as the astronaut, so astronaut, get parent file, list files with a filter, file get name ends with glb. And now I press save again, so now it re needs to redeploy. Gr we need to add a column or two, and this is really easy, we just say that it's file get name, and set a header name. And then let's add another column. Uh, let's show the size of the file also. Add column, so then we get a file and we do file.length plus bytes, bytes and a header size. And then to get this on the screen, now we want to show both the 3D model and the list of, of files, so we could, for instance, do a split layout. New split layout. And then um, left-hand side should be the grid, and right-hand side is the model viewer. Let's make this also size full. And let's make the grid size full also. Any graphical designer will really love me for this design. And then we, instead of adding the model viewer, we add the split layout. So now we always have a full-featured 
module browser. We're just missing one thing. We need to react to these clicks also to actually change what's shown. So for doing that, we can take the grid, add a click list, no, not a click, but an item click listener. And then we get some kind of event. And what we want to do is model viewer set SRC. And from the event we get get no not add a selection listener of course because then we can get the first selected item this also is used for multi-select so uh, we need to be explicit or else because it's an optional or else null and then we make to actually make this also support null so if file is null then we remove the src attribute and then we just return eagerly. So with this we have so we can select models to shoot to look at and then actually play with them also in the model viewer and we have this split layout so we can make this wide or small if we want to suit our screen size and so on. The things I have shown you, probably not best practices, but for instance shows that yes, this is Java running on the server all the time, even though it's really interactive in the browser. We can get things from the file system straight from a database if you want to, all those kinds of things. And that's really the core of how you use web components from Java with Vaadin. Yeah, so what we have learned today, web components, browser standards, custom element and shadow root, lets you do lots of cool things. You can do, use them on their own, you can use them with your favorite JavaScript framework, or you can use them with Vaadin. Vaadin lets you be really productive, it lets you use Java, and as we saw, you can build anything with it. Bunch of links if you're interested how to get started, if, you're, uh, if you want to try this out on your own. You can find us on GitHub, you can chat with us on Gitter or uh, on our own forum. And with that, we have some time for questions. But before you ask, I know some of you will ask, will this scale to 1 billion users? Or 10 billion users? Probably not. But it's fine, because most applications that most people are building, they have 100 users because it's just a small company and it's their inventory system or something. Maybe it's 1,000 users, maybe it's 10,000. The biggest Vardin application I'm aware of, it's a big bank uh, back office application with like about 100,000 employees using it daily. So. Yeah, no, it doesn't scale the same way as Micronaut or Quarkus or something, but it's still very, very useful. Any other questions? So the question was, uh, is it po possible to create, for instance, Android applications from the same Java code? Uh, yes and no. Uh, nowadays, Android is really capable. Uh, there's this thing called progressive web apps. So when you visit a website, Chrome on Android can ask, like, do you want to install this on the home screen? And then through that, you also get like offline functionality. You get access to a bunch of more advanced browser APIs also that regular web applications cannot use. So that's that's the recommended way if you want to build uh, mobile applications with this. Any other questions? Up there in the middle. Does it scale? Does it scale you, uh, so you can run multiple instances? Uh, yes and no. Uh, it scales, yes, uh, but we're really relying on the HTTP session. 
and uh, we put quite much like depending on what you actually show on the screen maybe between 100 kilobytes and a megabyte per user in the session that means that you cannot really do a session replication in a good way but uh, if you use sticky sessions then then that's that's the way to go basically any other questions yep Vardin and accessibility for screen readers. Uh, yes, uh, the built-in components we we have at least tried to to like test them in screen readers, add uh, area attributes where needed, and so on. Probably we haven't caught all the edge cases, but we will fix those as we discover them. So we we don't have any like certifications or that, but in general, like support is there. Yes. Yeah, it, it has it, it has been taken into account when designing the components. Yes. Anything else? I don't see any more hands. Scream if you still have something. All right. We support Java version eight and above. Now I think we're done. Thank you.